Well, I reckon I must be the oldest youth here. <laughs> so uh, we'll just have to put up with that. And um, uh, first, uh, what would interest you? I used to put, uh, was on a committee that put together the uh, questions for what they call the GRE, the Graduate Record Exam. And most of you, looking at you, probably will have to take a thing called the SAT. Is that right? Probably you will. Anyway, what is that? It's a multiple choice question uh, thing. And um, I used to, uh, when I was on this committee, uh, people would come up to me and say, the, the SAT, that's the worst exam that you can have. It's all the questions are wrong, they, they are not right in the way they've put together and so on. And what would surprise them, I would, they, I would say, well, yes, you are quite right. And I'm afraid that, in fact, the, it is true uh, that the SAT is, uh, uh, has all these problems. But the thing is, it's the only thing you've got, so you have to take it. So I'm going to talk about some things. Well, ta-da! There we are. <laughs> so uh, you will, w the thing is that uh, there are various little things that may help in, in taking the exam. The first thing is when you get an exam paper, and this goes for any multiple choice thing, then you should read through the exam paper, each question, and make sure you understand it. Now, you don't have to answer it. You shouldn't answer it, in fact. Uh, but you should uh, read it and understand it. Maybe you can answer it, of course, put, put down the, uh, the, the answer. But you have to understand it or you can't do anything. But don't answer it. Go right through the whole thing. Now, why do you do that? It's because of the way your brain works. After you've read it, your brain is working on this internally and you will maybe think of another way of doing it or improve on it simply by, by having it in your mind. The mind is a funny thing. After all, it's composed of neurons, and the neurons are either on or off. They fire or they don't fire. There's no, no in, in between. And if you think about that, that means all our thoughts, everything of love or the God or whatever, has to be capable of being expressed in binary like a computer. And of course, um, the question then arises, if that's the way your brain works, you can only think of things that can be expressed in binary. So does the universe have stuff that uh, is not expressible in binary? Because if it does, then we will never know it, since our brains will only understand. Just think about that. Anyway, uh, to, um, to, to go on, you read the thing, and then you, you have to understand each question. And after, you, and of course, if you immediately see the answer, you mark it. But having gone through it, quickly and understand the questions, then you have to go back and answer them. And the other thing that's interesting is that some people like to linger over a question. They'll think, well, if I do a little bit further, I can understand it. But don't forget, multiple choice questions, you have so much three minutes or something or other to answer it, and it's not worth going on and on. And it's interesting, um, since I was on this committee looking back on it, that uh, men seem to do that, but women don't. They like to solve the problem. They like to go through it. But of course, that's not the way a multiple choice, uh, 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 multiple choice works. Well, the other thing that I wanted to talk about with multiple choice is that uh, you should try and do as many tests, uh, 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 exams as you can. So the thing to do, they're, they're in, on the web. You can get them out of books and so on you should set up a time and uh, work on it uh, as, uh, for, let's say if it's a two hour test, then you, you set yourself a certain time in the afternoon, you do it right through that two hours and quit at that point. And then you go back and if you can get somebody who knows how to, uh, what the, the questions are, you get them to look at your results and see what you did wrong or do it yourself. And the more you do that, the better you get at it. And eventually, it sort of gets like, well, my wife likes to, to play Sudoku. I don't know how many of you do that, but all I know is that she spends all her time doing that. <laughs> and I have carefully avoided understanding how Sudoku works <laughs> because I shall get involved myself. 
Well, anyway, uh, so you, you take these tests and you will improve. And in fact, strangely enough, you may even get to like doing it just like you would with Sudoku or crossword puzzles. Uh, so anyway, that, that's the, um, the basic idea behind uh, what I wanted to say. Just those two things. One, to take a lot of tests. And it, 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 oddly enough, you'll probably get to enjoy it after a while. And of course, you have to learn the stuff as well. This is not, this is just how to take tests. And how to take tests, you can learn that in just the same way you would learn French or German or something. Okay, well, I wanted to uh, get, get that out first. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, myself and how I, I got into this business. Uh, first of all, um, I was born in a mill town very much similar to uh, what Columbia used to be. That shows what it was like in my hometown. This is a, a painting by a, a guy called Lowry who grew up in that kind of environment. So uh, as you can see, it's all foggy and everything was covered with black because it was sooty. And uh, the mills produced a tremendous amount of soot. So I uh, used to think that the town was black completely. And uh, then they got it all cleaned up when the coal went out of fashion and they use gas now. That's uh, Lawrence Bragg, who was the head of our department. I went to Cambridge uh, uh, by good luck and a certain amount of management uh, when, after I had finished at school. Now that shows uh, the equipment I was using when I started out. And as you will see, it looks like something from Frankenstein. <laughs> and the thing about that was that you can see that little guy in the gallery up at the top there. Well, those big machines used to charge up and uh, start across. And when I first started as a graduate student, uh, I was sent up into the gallery like that. And they turned on the machines in order that I could find out where they were sparking across to the gallery and all around, which, of course, was rather objectionable because it makes a tremendous bang when it goes off like lightning. Uh, OK. Um, so uh, I started out then, at, at, uh, went to a high school. Of course, in England, it was a private school, which is therefore called a public school. And you, if you look like uh, uh, mine was in a place called Bolton, but uh, the usual ones are um, at um, uh, uh, um, yeah, um, oh, what does it call now? Um, Eton and Harrow. They're the important ones. And mine was a much less important one. But nevertheless, it gave me a good education, got me into Cambridge. And you'll see it looks like a castle. It has this gateway there. And um, the reason is that it was uh, the, the, the money for it came from a guy who was a soap millionaire. And he obviously liked Tudor architecture, and that's why it had that uh, uh, rather uh, uh, big gateway there. Well, uh, from there, I, I was lucky enough to go to Cambridge. And the thing about um, uh, the, the, the lab there, it had been founded in 1870. Now, in 1870, there were no other scientific uh, establishments. So it uh, looked rather like a, um, uh, a um, what should I call it, um, a, 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 a cathedral, if you looked at the gateway. I don't know. Could I have the next slide? Oh, yeah, that's the guy that founded it, the Duke of Devonshire. He looks terribly stuffy, and he was. <laughs> <laughs> Could I have the next slide? Yes, that's the gateway. And as you can see, it looks like a cathedral. And the motto is Cavendo Tutus, which means safe by being cautious. Now, that's really not a very good motto for a <laughs> physics <laughs> department. So uh, could I have the next slide? That shows Free School Lane, which is where that gateway stands. And it was uh, rather interesting. The gateway locked at 5 every afternoon because people were supposed to go home to their families at that time. But of course, if you're doing nuclear physics, which I was, then you have to um, uh, work through the night and all. And you need a key to get in. So I got 
inherited this key from the previous graduate students who had inherited it from the previous ones from the previous ones. So mine was about the fifth or sixth generation and trying to open the gate with this key was quite difficult. Well, right above the uh, doorway, right to the right there, in fact, is where the custodian lived. And he would poke his head out of the window at night wearing a bowler hat and in his pajamas Pearl imprecations at us, and uh, we would then <laughs> apologize and have to very carefully open the door. Um, okay, well, um, the important thing here is that uh, the, one of the previous pr professors, of course, the professor is the head of the uh, lab, a man by the name of J.J. Thompson. Incidentally, in this lab, they discovered the electron, the nucleus, the neutron, and what was the other thing? And something else. But anyway, <laughs> it, it clearly was, uh, uh, and I thought when I got there, all the important, oh, the neutron, the neutron was discovered there too. I thought that the, uh, the, all the important days were gone by. Uh, but I did, <laughs> it just shows you how little you know, because my next door neighbors, I had a lab where I was doing nuclear physics, but on one side of me was the lab where there were two characters uh, called Watson and Crick, who were working on X-ray uh, stuff. And on the other side was a man called Max Perutz, who was also working on that stuff. Well, it turned out I used to have tea with Watson and Crick. And it's rather interesting because Watson was very quiet, but Crick was very voluble. If you talked about politics, he would have bright ideas about how we should change everything until it worked. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Crick would sit there, I mean, Watson would sit there and nod his head and so on. And yet it was Watson that wrote the book on the DNA. Well, they were chatting with me about this molecule they were working on that had thousands of radicals hanging on it. And uh, uh, it, it was clearly impossible for them to do it. So I told them they should quit on that <laughs> and, and work on these simpler molecules that they were also involved in. That's for what they were being paid for. Uh, luckily, they paid no attention to me and, <laughs> and went on to uh, work out the, uh, the, the structure for the DNA. Um, uh, the other one, the, the, uh, uh, Max Perutz, he had also been working on his molecule for quite a while. And this was a molecule called hemoglobin, which is used in the, uh, in the, in the bloodstream. All of our blood has this hemoglobin that, that uh, works on the oxygen. So this is how, why we're alive, <clears throat> because the oxygen, of course, is what uh, keeps us going. Um, and uh, he had not, <laughs> his was half complete. I should say that they have these uh, molecules that, that were built up. And, uh, oh, here it is. The uh, technicians were very ill paid at Cambridge. And so in the Christmas, on the same labs that turned out the DNA molecule, they would turn out a bowl. This is one of them, which was a Christmas present. You could buy it. They would sell us, the students, these that we, they would take, we would take home and present to our parents and so on. They're very beautiful. I, li I like this one. And so they, they would glue them together and turn them on the same lathes. They were at the same time making the DNA molecule. So it's, it's kind of interesting to look back on that. Now, what is particularly interesting to me is the fact that uh, when I was there with them, these were just ordinary students. Nobody had the foggiest idea that anything would happen. Maybe they would never work out the DNA, which is what I thought. A great big molecule with all these things hanging on it, who would ever be able to work that thing out? Anyway, of course, they did. And now, of course, you have thousands of people working <laughs> on the DNA and also hemoglobin. They, uh, the, the, that particular type of molecule is also very important. So it goes to show that uh, you can never tell what will happen in the future. I went on to, uh, uh, to, to Australia, uh, taking this uh, big accelerator out uh, with me and erecting it there. In fact, there too, uh, I did this at a place called Harwell in England. And, and uh, the guy who helped me take it down had been, he was an old guy and he attached a tag to each piece of, of stuff in the equipment. 
And I, young, and I said, thought, why do you do that? And I we just load it and send it. Boy, was I glad that he did that. When we put it back together again, the fact that he had these tags on it allowed us to finish in, in a really a reasonable time that would otherwise have been impossible. Our boss was Mark Oliphant. Now, what's interesting about Oliphant that most people don't know is that uh, he uh, probably, uh, 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 his work uh, meant that the World War II stopped a year earlier, both in, in, uh, in England and in the United States. Well, how did that happen? He was in charge of the development of a thing called the magnetron, the valve or tube, or whatever you like to call it, for high frequencies that didn't exist before that. This was used um, to detect incoming uh, aircraft from Germany, which otherwise would have been possible. And that saved England from the bombing, because the fighter planes were able to know where the incoming planes would be. So that, in fact, uh, the, this is the, uh, it was a very important thing and probably saved England. In America, what was interesting there was that Oliphant was also a nuclear physicist. He had to go in connection with the valve business the, to America a and he discovered that in England they discovered that um, the, um, the, the atom bomb, the calculations had been done by Piles in Birmingham, would, would be uh, just a, um, uh, not, not as big as a house, but as big as a very large suitcase, which of course it is. He went to America and discovered that the plans for this had been put in a drawer by uh, MIT, who had gotten this, which upset Oliphant. And he had to go to the West Coast and met with the guy who developed the cyclotron there, who also got bad, and they both went or, uh, to, uh, and got the whole thing started. That's what started the development of the atom bomb, which upset Oliphant many years later. But nevertheless, it meant that it, it's probably saved about a year in the development. So, well, I'll stop at that point, and uh, thank you very much.